all the welcoming. We do, yes. Thank you. And we are ready. We are live. I, I see that now. So we're going to call the meeting of the authority board to order and thank everyone for being here. Please give your attention to this short video. Due to COVID-19, this meeting will be conducted as a Zoom meeting pursuant to the provisions of the Governor's Executive Order N-2920, which suspends certain requirements of the Brown Act. This meeting is being live streamed on the CCTA website. The chair will call upon members, staff, and other speakers by name. Please speak clearly and state your name before giving comments or remarks. Persons participating via Zoom with their cameras enabled are reminded that their activities are visible to viewers. Members participating by Zoom wishing to speak should physically raise their hand and unmute their mic when called upon. Members should remute their mics when done speaking. Citizens participating by Zoom wishing to speak should use the raise hand feature or dial star 9 if participating via phone and the chair or staff will call upon them at the appropriate time. Citizens will have three minutes to speak. A 30 second warning will be provided. After three minutes, staff will lower their hand and mute their mic. Participants via phone will be called upon by the last four digits of their phone number. It is requested that public speakers state their names and organization, but providing such information is voluntary. Written public comments received in accordance with the COVID-19 Special Notice for Public Comment Guidelines are printed on the meeting agenda. If authors of the written correspondence would like to speak, they should raise their hand and the chair will call upon them at the appropriate time. All written correspondence received after that and during the meeting will be entered into the record. A roll call vote will be taken for all action items. Thank you for participating in a meeting of the Contra Costa Transportation Authority. Thank you. And Terry Ann, will you please conduct the roll call? Yes. Commissioner Arnrich? Here. Commissioner Butt? She's absent. Commissioner Glover? Here. Commissioner Haskew? She's connecting to audio. I see her present. Commissioner Hudson? Yes. Commissioner Mitchell? Yeah, uh, here. Commissioner Nowak? Here. Commissioner Thorpe? Here. Commissioner White? Here. Vice Chair Kelly? Here. Chair Geringer? Here. Go back to uh, Commissioner Haskew. I'm here. Thank you. Representative Allen? Here. Representative Powers? Here. Representative Work? Here. Commissioner Butt? Did not see him arrive. Okay. Um, everyone is present with Commissioner Butt absent, and we also have Commissioner Alternate Fidelli with us tonight. Great. Thank you. And again, welcome everyone. Um, the next item on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be read by Commissioner Arnerich. And I ask that everyone else please mute your mics during the Pledge of Allegiance. And thank you, Newell. Thank you. Please join by placing your uh, right hand over your heart. And repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, too. Great, thank you, Commissioner Arnrich. And now we're moving on to the next item on the agenda, which is public comment. And so members of the public are invited to address the authority meeting, authority board on any item that is not listed on the agenda. And um, are there any uh, members of the public who would like to address the authority board at this time? You will please raise your hand and Terry Ann or I will call on you. I don't see any hands raised on the participants menu. So I have not okay. received any public comment and there's no one raising their hand. Okay, thank you, Terry Ann. You're and welcome. so we don't have any presentations this evening. And we do have lots on our agenda, so we but we don't have any presentations this evening. So the next item on the agenda is the consent calendar. Do we have any changes, comments, or does anyone from the authority board want to pull an item on the consent calendar? 
not seeing any raised hands or real or um, virtual. And so is there anyone from the public who would like to speak to an item on the consent calendar or pull the item if you'll raise your hand at this moment, Terry Ann or I will call on you. And I don't see any- No public comment. I just wanna note that Commissioner Butt just arrived. I did see that, thank you. And um, do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. So moved. <laughs> Let's see who said it first. I think Thorpe. Mayor, Commissioner Thorpe did. Um, and do I have a second? Second. Commissioner Nowak. So we have a, a motion by Commissioner Thorpe and a second by Commissioner Nowak. Terry Ann, will you please conduct the roll call vote? Yes, thank you. Commissioner Arnrich? Yes. Commissioner Butt? Yes. Commissioner Glover? Yes. Commissioner Haskew? Yes. Yeah. Commissioner Hudson? Yes. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes. Commissioner Nowak? Yes. Commissioner Thorpe? Aye. Commissioner White? Yes. yes. Vice Chair Kelly? Yes. Chair Geringer? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. You're welcome. And now we're moving quickly to agenda item number eight, and which is our beginning of our regular agenda items. And the next item on our agenda will be um, the next in our series of um, updates on Innovate 680 provided by Stephanie Hu. And she is ready to go. Thank you, Stephanie. Can you hear me? Thanks. Yes, now I okay. can. Great. It was we, we all can. Yeah, and you can see the slide, okay? I trust that you can see. Great. Um, good evening, Chair and everyone. Um, my name is Stephanie Hu, Director of Projects DCTA um, and the Program Manager for Innovate 680. Um, like the Chair has mentioned, this is uh, part four of our Innovate 680 board series. And this evening, we'll be focusing on the advanced technology project, including the managed freeways and the coordinated adaptive ramp metering, which we're calling CARM. Um, and with that, I'll hand it off to um, Darren Henderson. He's from WSP and um, Darren's on. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, let me know if I have too much background noise. Um, I'm sitting in Denver airport right now and there's a lot of noise and chaos going on around me. So I apologize if there's too much, just let me know. Um, I'm also on a mobile hotspot, so I can't promise that I'll be on stable the whole time. So let me know if you stop being able to hear me. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, one more. So as Stephanie said, um, you know, this is the fourth in the series of updates on Innovate 680. Um, at your last meeting, uh, you heard from one of my colleagues, Liz Justison, uh, who discussed the uh, program concept of operations, uh, which is a document that we are preparing to summarize all of the potential components of Innovate 680 um, and how they all fit together. And so this system architecture diagram is an illustration of that mix of projects and the interconnectivity between them. Stephanie, if you can give it one more click. Um, today, we are gonna focus on the managed motorways portion of that. Um, and you can see that box now highlighted. Uh, it is a fundamental element of our advanced technologies project. And so we'll get into some of the details on how managed motorways work, um, what exactly we're doing for our project. Um, Stephanie, if you give it one more click. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, we're really focused right now on one of the components of managed motorways, which we call coordinated adaptive ramp metering or CARM. Um, and that is really where we'll focus a lot of the discussion this evening. Um, but at the end of the presentation, I'll actually loop back to this diagram and I'll show you how this really becomes a foundational element of our advanced technologies project and provides a great deal of potential for integrating a lot of other components into that managed motorways framework. So Stephanie, if you can go forward. So we'll focus right now on managed freeways and or, or managed motorways, um, depending on how you want to call them. From now on, I'm going to call them managed freeways, um, just for an American context. Um, basically, managed freeways provide a new approach for controlling freeway operations, but they use tools that are already familiar to us, things like ramp meters, things like lane use management signs. Um, and you can see a, a photograph here of one of the managed motorways in Melbourne, Victoria in Australia. 
um, where it features the, the ramp meters on the left, the lane use management signs in the middle, and then the um, variable message signs actually communicating traveler information to the drivers in the distance. And the way we package these together is to provide a comprehensive uh, package of strategies that work together to allow us to optimize freeway traffic flows. Go ahead, please. So the concept was initially developed by the Victoria Department of Transportation in Australia, um, in the city of Melbourne. Uh, Melbourne's managed motorway system has now expanded to include over 100 miles of freeways. And you can see a map here that illustrates the full extent of their system. Um, it's not just in Melbourne anymore. They've now opened up additional facilities in Brisbane and Perth. And I'm actually here in Denver today um, where we were doing field inspections of the project that we have for Colorado DOT um, called Smart 25, which we'll be launching in the fall. Go ahead, please, Stephanie. Why are we interested in managed freeways? Um, they're really providing some pretty significant benefits uh, where they have been deployed. And we're looking to replicate some of those benefits in Contra Costa County. Um, in the case of Melbourne's projects, they've seen an increase of about 25% in their traffic flows during their peak periods. And what that means is on their four lane freeways, they're effectively moving the equivalent of, an, of a fifth lane of traffic during the peak period. Without having to add any additional capacity, they're getting better performance on their system, which is allowing them to effectively move that much more traffic. And that then translates into a variety of different economical travel time, accident rate reductions, all sorts of different um, benefits that help the region and help make the business case for developing these types of projects. Go ahead, please, Stephanie. So while it's using familiar um, tools, it's applying them in different ways. So for example, coordinated adaptive ramp metering is a really core element of managed freeways. And while it uses ramp metering, which I'm sure you've seen different examples of ramp metering in the Bay Area, um, the way that we do ramp metering for managed freeways requires using multiple control algorithms that are looking at a variety of different traffic control aspects on the freeway system, and also can look at um, uh, traffic on the arterial system in order to optimize the flows on the freeway corridor. And if we can get better performance out of the freeways themselves, that provides benefit to the arterial system because they no longer, the arterial system no longer has to take that additional traffic that has to divert to the arterials when the freeways become congested. And it does that by balancing the demand on all of the ramps in a corridor so that that way we can regulate the queues along the full length of the corridor and ensure that no one location is being overly burdened in that process. And later on in the presentation, I'll actually show you a series of slides that illustrates that function in action from an actual project. Go ahead, please, Stephanie. The system uses a very advanced traffic management system to actually control those operations. And in the case of the Australian projects, they use a product called Transmax Streams. Uh, Streams. And we are looking to use that same pro program um, to control our managed freeway in Contra Costa County. Uh, one of the elements that makes Streams very effective is that it integrates all of your ITS devices, all of those intelligent transportation system devices that you have in the corridor, on a common platform so that they can work together harmoniously to better improve your freeway operations. And typically what we find on existing projects in the US is that those systems can work on independent platforms. And that means that often they can be competing against each other and not necessarily providing us the maximum benefit. So by consolidating them into a single platform, they can be far more effective. Go ahead, please, Stephanie. It also provides us some really powerful um, dashboard tools for monitoring the overall status of our system, um, the various tools that we're using, and also to track uh, real-time performance on the system so that we can actually see the benefits as they're occurring. And these will become really powerful and useful to us when we deploy these systems to be able to have these types of discussions with you and communicate and demonstrate exactly the benefits that we're seeing in these corridors. Go ahead, please, Stephanie. So I'm gonna give you a couple of case studies um, just to, to show you examples of exactly how these programs have been effective overseas. This is a project from um, Brisbane in Australia. Um, it's called the Bruce Highway. Um, although the traffic is oriented backwards to the, what it is in the United States, 
that photo should look very familiar to you. It looks just like any other congested freeway corridor. This was a morning commute back in 2014. Um, a major bottleneck at that overcrossing that you can see in the left-hand photo where the traffic entered the freeway at that location that caused it to back up for several miles every morning. That does not sound um, familiar at all, does it? So if you go forward, Stephanie. The solution was to implement a managed freeways pilot project that encompassed five arterial ramps, um, both upstream and downstream of that bottleneck location to better manage the flows along that entire freeway corridor and also from the arterials that approach that freeway. Uh, go ahead, please, Stephanie. So this is a heat plot. Um, this is one of the tools that we as traffic um, planners and, and traffic engineers use to help analyze uh, traffic conditions. And for those of you that are not familiar with this particular diagram, um, you can see on the, on the um, left of the screen, the direction of flow. So this is the direction that traffic is traveling along the freeway. And you can see across the x-axis or the bottom of the screen, the time of day. So this particular exhibit starts at five o'clock in the morning and runs through nine o'clock in the morning. So this is a typical morning peak period. Um, yellow is generally free flow speeds and the darker purples and blacks that you see is the onset of congestion. And typically what happens at this location and also at many other freeway locations in Contra Costa County, um, traffic breaks down at a bottleneck, uh, the queues start to build behind it. So you see those waves of congestion um, moving diagonally down the screen. And once it has broken down, it tends to stay in a broken down state for a very extended period of time until demand falls and we can recover and get back to a free flow condition. So purple, bad. And you can see there's quite a bit of that on this example. However, if Stephanie goes to the next slide, you'll see that after managed freeways were implemented, they were effectively able to control that bottleneck. And you can see that there are still some moments of time when we see instable um, traffic and reductions in speed but they aren't causing the entire freeway to break down. We're able to control the flow into those locations and that allows us to achieve much greater productivity through this corridor. And that's exactly what we're trying to emulate in the 680 corridor by introducing managed freeway. Go ahead, please, Stephanie. So this is that example that I was talking about where I'll actually sort of walk through how the system works. And in this plot, the blue is the similar heat plot um, that we were looking at before. So you can see actually from the bottom of the screen, you can almost see like the diagonal lines moving up the screen. Those are platoons of traffic moving along the freeway. So you have flows at times that are heavier than others. And so those bands of slightly darker to slightly lighter reflects those platoons of traffic moving along the full length of the freeway corridor. The brown represents the ramp signals themselves um, where ramp metering has been installed. And the darker the color of the brown, the longer that the red time is being implemented. So if you click the next slide, please, please Stephanie. The critical bottleneck location is just um, downstream of Anzac Avenue where that particular ramp enters the freeway. And you can see there's a slightly darker band that runs horizontally across the screen. That means that the traffic is more dense at that location. Therefore, it represents the major bottleneck in our corridor. If you click the next slide, please, Stephanie. Um, at 5.20 in the morning, you can see that one little tiny dark blip well, that's when the system recognizes that the traffic is now becoming pretty dense. We're concerned that it might cause the freeway to break down. And so you can see that the ramp meters have come on at Anzac Avenue and also at Boundary Road, the next, the next um, location upstream. A little later in the morning, you can see that the dark um, or the brown color at Anzac Avenue is starting to ebb from light to dark, light to dark, light to dark. And what's happening at that location is the ramp itself is beginning to back up and is getting closer to the arterial. And so we're changing the cycle lengths to speed them up and let more traffic onto the freeway and then reduce it back and hold some more traffic back when we can. But we're not able to fully control that location by doing that. So now what we're doing is we're extending the cycle time at Boundary Road. And you can see that darker blob um, in the 611 time slot where we're holding more traffic back at Boundary because we can, and that's helping to balance the demand at Antic Avenue. Similarly, the meters now come on at Deception Bay Road further down. Um, and it's also helping to control that one location. And so by having all of the signals work together to control that one location, we can basically ensure that the freeway doesn't fall down into a congested state. And you can see it happens a couple other times during the morning where the same cycle occurs. But basically, by the end of the day, we've been able to sustain traffic flows and get far more productivity. And again, that's exactly what we're trying to emulate in the 680 corridor. Go ahead, please, Stephanie. 
So another example comes from my hometown, um, Perth, Australia, and this is for the Kwanana Freeway. This is the most recent project to start. Um, go ahead, please, Stephanie. So in this case, again, um, five uh, interchange locations where ramp signals were added and are being coordinated. And then they also added a series of land use management signs um, illustrated in the left part of the exhibit. Go ahead, please, Stephanie. And this project saw similar benefits. And rather than me tell you, I'm going to let this gentleman tell you from one of the news reports of the day. First Smart Freeway has passed its first big test, significantly reducing peak hour traffic. Some drivers halved their usual drive time to the city. But other commuters are already making mistakes. This was the Kunana Freeway in morning peak hour three weeks ago. And this was today. The state government so keen to promote its new smart freeway, it provided these pictures. We also road tested it ourselves. 8.04 at Farrington Road, within five minutes, we're at the Mount Henry Bridge and into the city in just another six minutes. The new smart freeway providing an 11 minute run from Leeming to the CBD. It was a lot quicker getting here today, a lot less stressful, so happy days. They've right? done it right for a change. <laughs> well done main roads. One reason there's less congestion is traffic signals at six on ramps to stagger vehicles merging onto the freeway, but drivers entering are still getting used to it. Vehicles are tending to queue in the right lane when there's multiple lanes. They're not equally distributing across all lanes. Well, that's adjustment. I think very quickly people will realise that they don't have to sit in this queue, they can go down the other lane. So just imagine a similar news report in the Bay Area um, talking about the success of our managed freeways project in Contra Costa County. That's what we can aspire to. And what we saw on the Perth project is they basically halved their travel time um, for the, the about 13 mile journey um, that it takes to get from the, the outer edge of that study area to downtown. Um, and at the same time, increased their flows by about the same 25 to 30 percent that we've seen in Melbourne. And what that means is that they were basically getting an additional 500 vehicles per lane on their free lane on their three lane freeway. So a very substantial improvement um, in flows. And then you can also see in the exhibit on the right there, the, the lighter blue lines, um, squiggly lines reflect the total travel times prior to the opening of the project. And then you can see down at the very bottom, day one and day two, um, the actual travel times that were observed once the managed freeways were in operation. And again, those are exactly the sort of results that we'll be looking for in uh, Contra Costa County. Now go ahead, please, Stephanie. So what are we doing in Contra Costa County? Well, let's talk a little bit more about your project. Um, go ahead, please, Stephanie. So Caltrans um, was successful in getting a shop grant um, last year uh, to help fund the installation of ramp meters along the entire length of 680 in Contra Costa County, as well as some um, short sections in Alameda and Solano counties. And while they're not um, metering every location, they will be metering many of them, but they were proposing to use uh, traditional Caltrans ramp metering. And that's had some mixed results um, based on experiences in uh, the Bay Area and also in Southern California. Um, so we're working with uh, Caltrans um, through an integrated team agreement between CCTA and Caltrans to help develop the additional elements that would need to be incorporated into their project in order to have it operate as a managed freeway. And that integration has been going quite well so far. Um, we hope that process will continue and that we'll be successful in integrating those elements into the Caltrans project to make it effectively operate as a managed freeway. Um, go ahead, please, Stephanie. So for our project, we're looking at the full length of the 680 corridor in Contra Costa County, all the way from the Solano County line down to the Alameda County line. And in fact, we actually have a, a ramp in Alameda County um, that we're also proposing would be controlled as part of our project. It's a 25 mile study corridor. It includes over 50 on ramps along the full length. And we're proposing to meter pretty much every one of them along that corridor so that that way we can have that entire system working together to better control traffic within the corridor. Go ahead, please, Stephanie. So we've conducted an initial feasibility study. We started by looking at the um, existing conditions within the corridor. This data is actually from 2018, so it's pre-COVID, um, and is indicative of the traffic um, congestion that was recurring in the corridor every day. The dark red representing congestion, um, the lighter blue and green colors representing more free flow conditions. You can see in the northbound direction some 
congestion in the southern half of the corridor during the mornings and a much more significant um, bulge of congestion um, in the northern half of the corridor between South Main and Treat in the evening peak periods. And then in the southbound direction, similar um, congestion in the main um, area on the approach to State Route 24 in the mornings, and then some minor um, pockets of congestion in the afternoon peak periods. We think that many of those bottlenecks can be managed with managed freeways. And so that is what we're striving to accomplish with this project. Uh, go ahead, please, Stephanie. So when we are considering managed freeways, we, we take a slightly different approach from the way that Caltrans might analyze a, a corridor for traditional ramp metering. Um, of course, we do look at the storage space and the discharge that's required on the ramps themselves, but we also look at the mainline operations and see if there's any low hanging fruit that could be resolved um, as part of the project to improve our mainline capacity. We then analyze um, the maximum sustainable flow rate, how much traffic we can actually move through the corridor. Um, and that then helps create the baseline that we use to determine how effective CARM can be to manage demand, particularly where we have those bottleneck locations. We then use a tool called an R model to analyze metering rates at the various ramps along the corridor. That helps us to understand exactly how much storage we will require and how much discharge we need at those locations. And we were able to conduct all of that work using November 2019 volumes um, that were retrieved from PEMS right after the onset of the pandemic. So we were able to use conditions that were stable before um, the shutdowns started to occur in the region. Go ahead, please, Stephanie. So the results tell us that there are quite a few locations where this is very feasible um, and quite easy to implement. There are a handful of locations, those highlighted in yellow, where additional storage will be required and there may be some um, improvements required in order to accomplish that. And then there's a couple locations where we do have um, pretty significant constraints to providing sufficient capacity. Um, we'll be taking a closer look at those to determine if there are any solutions that could be effective. But the beauty of a managed freeways tool is that if you have a couple of these locations where they are constrained, the system can compensate for that and can use other locations upstream and downstream to manage that location more effectively. Um, the next slide will show us the northbound direction. You're looking at the southbound right now. It's a similar result, um, mostly feasible, a uh, handful of locations that are a little more constrained and then a couple or three that are uh, particularly critical um, and challenging for providing sufficient capacity. And again, we'll continue to work with Caltrans and with CCTA staff to evaluate those and to come up with some specific recommendations. We'll report back to you when we've got those. Uh, go ahead, please, Stephanie. So our analysis tells us that we should be effective in more um, in, in better managing um, traffic flows in the corridor if we use CARM. Um, there are some additional mainline operational constraints um, that will increase the risk of bottlenecks along the corridor. Um, but we still think that we can be very effective in managing those using uh, a managed freeways approach. Um, we do think it's necessary to add um, freeway to freeway metering for the uh, uh, southbound, I'm sorry, eastbound 24 to southbound 680 connectors. Um, there's a lot of demand that is coming on at that location and we need to be able to manage that gateway um, to, in order to be effective. What we've found is that we can generally accomplish a four minute wait time, which is actually fairly good for ramp metering systems and is the target that we use for managed freeways. Um, we think we can manage those along this corridor um, and ensure that the ramps work effectively. And more importantly, by, ban by balancing the queues um, along all of the ramps, we can also prevent those queues from spilling back onto your arterial streets. So we can manage that traffic on the freeway ramps themselves at pretty much all of the locations um, in the corridor. And we'll continue to take a closer look and make sure that there's no other, that there's no other issues, but um, we're pretty confident that that can be the case. Go ahead, please, Stephanie. Now, I mentioned before that uh, Streams has some pretty powerful um, dashboards for real-time monitoring. That then gives us the ability to um, develop traveler information and to publish that um, out in the field by using variable message signs. So communicating to drivers what their options are and uh, how long those trips might take. Um, that can also be integrated into other elements of the advanced technologies project, like this, the shared mobility hubs and the ModMAS applications. Um, so this will be very informative in those. And then go ahead, please, Stephanie. We'll also use um, variable message signs at the freeway ramps themselves to give more functionality to those signs so that if the ramps have to close for re different reasons, we can communicate that to the public. Um, we can also look at the capabilities to do some arterial signal coordination 
I mean, if we do in fact need to use arterials as part of our storage or as part of our system, um, the, the, this uh, streams provides the ability to coordinate those very effectively. Um, and so we'll be looking at those opportunities as we continue to develop the project. Go ahead, please, Stephanie. So I promised I would circle back at the end of the presentation. So here we are. Um, again, we were focused on the managed motorways or managed freeways aspect of the advanced technologies project and particularly the coordinated adaptive ramp metering. If you give us a click, Stephanie. Um, I also mentioned the fact that um, the stream system has very robust performance monitoring dashboards and that gives us the ability to provide traveler information, traveler messaging um, inherently as part of the system. One more click, please, Stephanie. We can also expand um, those systems to include things like land use management systems and variable speed limits, um, if those are desired in Contra Costa County. But probably more importantly, with one more click, Stephanie, the capabilities of the managed motorways um, active traffic management system really start to get us toward the decision support system and being able to expand those capabilities to include some other elements of the advanced technologies project. And if Stephanie gives me one last click, that could include things like automated driving systems, integration with the shared mobility hubs, um, the part-time transit lanes and the metering that will be required in order to ensure that that can operate effectively. And then also again on the arterial systems, looking at the potential to integrate coordinated adaptive traffic signals on those arterial, on that, on that arterial network. So this can really become a foundational element of the advanced technologies. We will continue to evaluate possibilities for that as we do this demonstration project. Um, but certainly in the short term, the desire is to get some of those traffic flow benefits out onto the 680 corridor and make life much better for all of the residents of Contra Costa County. On that, I will certainly take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Darren. And that was actually remarkably clear and concise considering you're sitting in an airport. Um, so thank you very much. And I'm glad that your coverage, your um, Wi-Fi held out with us or your hotspot. So are there any board members who have questions or comments for Darren or for Stephanie or for um, Commissioner Arn um Actually, Commissioner Butt had his virtual hand up and then Commissioner Arnridge. Okay, thank you. Um, you, you know, this is, this is fascinating and uh, really kind of exciting, um, but I've always had a, a little bit of skepticism about, um, you know, ab about these, these programs. And it, it doesn't mean that I don't think we ought to be doing it, but I think that we, we ought to be looking at, at all the aspects of it. And um, for example, you know, the presentation said that, that uh, a program, a pro project like this could be equivalent to adding a, 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 an additional lane. And I guess if you're, if you're an automobile commuter and uh, traffic congestion is, is an issue for you, providing an extra lane is just really great. On the other hand, uh, adding an additional lane, whether it's done through technology or whether it's done by, by, by building it, um, it is growth inducing. Uh, it encourages people to uh, move to outlying areas that they might not otherwise consider. It certainly induces a growth in vehicle miles traveled. Um, and because of that, it, 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 it uh, discourages people from looking at alternatives like carpooling and public transportation. So I think that's something we ought to be looking at. I, I don't think this is all good. I think, I think there are downsides and, and maybe those downsides don't exist. And if they don't, um, I think that ought to, be, ought to be part of the explanation. I, I also saw in the presentation that one of the advantages is a reduction of greenhouse gases. And I'm not sure where that comes from. Maybe it's because people aren't idling or something like that. But I, I, think, that needs, I think that needs more explanation. Um, some other concerns I've, I've had about this from the beginning is, you know, is the idea that, that by uh, stacking people up in a metered on-ramp, we're increasing uh, the flow of traffic on the freeway. So, 
maybe we ought to be looking at this as a as a door to door issue. Are we saving time door to door, or are we just saving time once people get on the freeway? You know, one of the one of the uh, statistics noted said that that there there was something about a a, a four minute um, uh, dwell time on on ramps because of metering. Well, you know, if if uh, if traffic is move, moving at the limit, you know, four mile four minutes is four miles, and um, so you know the question is, sure, you're you're may, maybe the people who are already on the freeway can move faster, but the people who want to get on it are sitting behind a, a metering light waiting to get on. And which brings up another concern I've always had, and that is that the system favors the upstream commuters over the downstream commuters. For example, if you're talking about, and I brought this up years ago, if you're talking about Interstate 80, uh, this program favors the people who come from, say, Solano County over the people who come from my city, Richmond. The people, the people in Solano County are breezing right on down because, because, uh, uh, be, because the program has increased flow of the freeway. People from my city are, are waiting on the on-ramps behind a metering light. So I think that, uh, and, and, and I guess there's a couple of final things is that I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how the system adapts to breakdowns, you know, for example, one of the big bottlenecks in my area is the Richmond San Rafael Bridge. And under normal circumstances, it, it, it flows pretty well most of the time. But if you get one breakdown, everything stops and it can go on for hours. And so, you know, how, how does this system deal with, with breakdowns? And then kind of circling back around to, uh, you, you know, there's such a huge emphasis on on moving cars along the freeway, but I don't see any, you know, I don't see any discussion about carpooling and public transportation and things like that. So again, you know, I'm, I'm a little skeptical. I'm not a cynic, but I, I think there are a lot of issues here that in our zeal to embrace technology and talk about what a great thing we're doing, I, I think we're leaving out a, a lot of the side effects that that should at least be explored. So thank you for the time. Thank you, Commissioner But Does anyone from staff want to respond to that or? Yeah, I can take some of the questions and if Darren wants to chime in on the more technical aspects of such as the breakdown, but um, Commissioner Butt, I, we are on the fourth part of our series and next week or next month, we'll be talking about some or next time be some of the transit elements of Innova 680, um, you know, in addition to the car, the adaptive ramp metering, we're also part of the program is share mobility hubs and express buses. And really to look at the program as a whole, there's different aspects of our program that balances each other's out. And I think we are really looking, interested in reducing VMT and is not just for the, 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 the vehicles. Um, if, if the freeway is traveling faster, it also enables our express buses to travel or be more efficient as well. So we, we do have the concerns that you, you just shared and we are, we do, there are elements in the program that we will discuss in, the, in our later parts of our series to talk about some of the transit elements and um, elements that would promote um, multimodal usage and not just vehicle centric. Um, I, I don't know, Darren, if you had anything to add in terms of the breakdown, how does the yeah, system, um, heard the questions about the system, how it, it reacts to the breakdown. Yeah, well. uh, Commissioner Brett certainly covered a lot of territory there. Um, so we could probably spend another hour or two talking about all of those things. Let me just leave it at this for now um, and be reassured that we are considering a lot of those those items that you mentioned you know those are all important considerations as we develop these projects in order to ensure that we're getting a, a holistic and comprehensive solution um, but but basically the way the system works is you know today um, under normal conditions traffic flows build until the freeway can no longer handle them and then the lanes become degraded they break down and they become congested and when that happens we see a substantial drop in the flow of traffic so we may be moving sort of 1800 vehicles per lane per hour when things are moving freely. Um, but once it breaks down, those flows can fall to like 1200 vehicles per lane per hour. 
So what we're trying to do with managed freeways is to recapture those flows so that the system can work more effectively. Um, what happens when the freeway breaks down uh, is a number of things. Um, it becomes unsafe. Um, we see major increases in accidents. And so by stabilizing the traffic flows, we can help improve safety in the corridor. And that's been observed in, in the projects that have happened before. But we also see diversion. Um, we see a lot of traffic that then diverts onto the arterial network and seeks you know, alternative paths to getting stuck on the freeways. And so what we try to do with managed freeways is to recapture what the freeways were intended to do, which was to move those longer distance trips um, in a more equitable manner. Um, we have all of the ramps working together so that there is equity in accessing the freeway so that the downstream locations aren't taking more of the burden from the upstream, upstream locations. We're really using all of the locations along the freeway to do it. And the last comment I'll make is when we present the travel times um, related to managed freeways, we are talking about the travel time from door to door. We're talking about the time to get on the freeway as well as the time that you spend on the freeway itself. And what we find is that for the four minutes that you may spend at a ramp on a particularly heavy day, you may be saving 20 minutes on the main line. And so that offset is more significant than the delay that you're incurring on the ramp itself. So I'll leave it at that for now, um, but I can rest, you can rest assured that I will certainly be back and we'll be talking about many more of those technical details as we advance the project. Okay, thank you. And next we have Commissioner Arnridge and then Commissioner Hudson. Great, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I, you know, I'm really excited about this project because I think it is the, if we don't do this, um, we're not gonna build more roads. We're not widening roads. 680 is as wide as it can get. Um, and the technology will help um, the environment in a lot of ways that's been stated. Um, the only thing I've heard though um, that bothers me, <laughs> um, and I've never heard it before, was talking about ramp metering between Highway 24 and 680. Um, just high level view, you're talking about a freeways, freeways that were designed to merge with each other at freeway speeds. So those, um, those curves where they, they join are designed at 70 miles an hour. Um, and the idea is, is that we, we I just don't see feasible and, and you don't have to spend a year figuring this out to ramp meter a freeway to a freeway uh, yeah. So um, actually, if you go south on 680 today um, and transition to the 580, there's actually ramp meters on those connectors from the 680 to the 580. So we would be replicating those types of, of metered locations. There are a handful of um, connectors um, that we are not proposing to meter. So for example, eastbound, 680, eastbound 24 to northbound 680. Um, that's more of a mainline move um, on the left side of the freeway. So we're not proposing to meter that directional movement. And similarly on, uh, is it 242 coming south onto the 680? Um, that's pretty much a straight shot. Uh, and it would be very dangerous to try and introduce metering on that location. But for the 24 connector from eastbound to southbound, it does exit on the right side. It's more of a traditional ramp exit. And so we think that that is capable of being metered similar to the 580 meters. Um, and we think it's necessary in order to be able to manage the section of freeway just south of- So, so let me be clear, I, I didn't get to finish. I'm telling you, I don't think that's feasible. Um, somebody who has been driving through there for 40 years, um, and I drive every day. In fact, I drove through there um, twice today. Um, when you just study the patterns and who is that, the, the majority of those people are Alamo, Danville and some San Ramon, and that's about it. So they have a short distance. So um, if, and, and the speeds that people go through, I would just be shocked. And I will tell you this, I'm pretty adamant. If that's the direction you're going on this, you're gonna have an uphill battle. And, and, and if you wanna sit there, you can do the math all day. You gotta drive it, you gotta understand that. That is not how, we started this project. The idea of taking, and you want to call it a freeway? It, no, these are two freeways that merge. It's not a ramp. And if we're going that direction on that, then you know I'm 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 going to tell you I'm going to be a lot more involved in that. But all the things we're talking up and down in the quarter. Now there is an issue in Lafayette 
on eastbound 24 for, um, it's, it's the only on-ramp along 24 between the tunnel going eastward. And it's the main Lafayette um, uh, entry exit. It has a really heavy volume. So doing ramp meter would help throttle that. But if you think you're gonna just force all that traffic, which by the way is gridlocked right now, even during COVID. So today at four o'clock, if you went from Lafayette eastbound 24 to go southbound, it was bumper bumper traffic until you just get through because it's everybody going northbound that's blocking you from going southbound. Um, doing some ramp metering um, in the two others, well, maybe Oxalonics as well. But if those were coordinated, it would help it flow. Um, and I think that's the concept. But the idea of taking a major freeway to a major freeway, and, and I don't care what, and I understand what 580, 680 is, it's not the same. So I don't need a response. I just want you to know you got an uphill battle and you're gonna to have to work really, 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 really hard to come up with a convincing solution in that and fast talking won't cut it. So I'm just giving you a heads up, you know, think about it, take it food for thought, take it seriously um, and just be real cautious before we head down that path. Thank you, Commissioner Arnerich. So next, Commissioner Hudson and then Vice Chair Kelly. Newell, I just want to tell you that what I've learned from the 58680 on-ramp, off-ramp is we can turn it off once we realize that you're right. And it, it is, I rarely see the thing on, but it's pretty much this, it can be the same situation. It's a tool. And that's where I was going to go until uh, it, it brought that up. When I first saw that, I go, you're kidding, right? But now it's just a sign that I see as I wave and go by. But maybe at six, seven in the morning, it's not so easy to wave and go by, especially going in the opposite direction. I kind of take the different position than, than Tom does on this. Uh, the ramp meter to me, it's just a tool. We're trying to create spacing so that things will move. Uh, an even bigger tool for me is the connected vehicle. If we can get people to just stop leaving four, five, eight car lengths between the car ahead of you and that, uh, where we'll be in better shape. The reason I probably take a little bit different position than you on this, Tom, is that it's vehicle miles traveled and it's part of the jobs housing balance that we've been working for in the corridor. If we actually had it uh, in every city, we wouldn't have as big a problem, but you're never gonna get it Moraga, Arenda, and Lafayette. They're not going to be a 50% you know, a, a outflow every morning. It's just not the nature of what's going on over there. But if you really wanna talk about growth inducing, the single worst weapon that I've seen in the last two years is Zoom. I mean, you have industries where all these people are going, they will remain nameless south of us, and they're just buying up the Central Valley right now on their premise that maybe they have to go to work two or three times a week. And many of us, as I'm looking around at smiling faces, remembered the word displacement. Well, wait until you see they get a feel for that out in San Juan uh, of what we're doing. And there's going to be a tremendous kickback. It's too late for them now. The other part of it is that I think is going to be a major component of this, and we really need to get this report, is the Blue Ribbon Task Force. I mean, we're going to use this Solano um, uh, Innovate 680, whatever you want to call it, hydrogen bus down from Solano into San Ramon. But we have met the other part of this equation and that we're going to give free transit to anybody that lives or works within the business park and we're setting up four new transit things uh, bus stops whatever you want to call them there'll be more buses going there including people that want to get on you see in san francisco i hope it's not that bad where people just hop out of a car when you stop but i mean this is where we're going and that's where the focus goes on something I've been bugging Tim since I first heard it at the MTCA bag ledge meeting, mobility hubs. Mobility hubs are gonna be a big component out of this thing where people, you know, just like they're picking up a train, you go to one spot, you're in the mobility hub, people gather and boom, they go. But it's gonna be one or two or five or six things, not just one or two uh, to make it work. It's, it's going to have to be the whole program. And that's why I think you're on the right track. I kind of like the idea. See, you brought somebody in from Australia, so it's got to be good. 
probably should have brought somebody from Sydney, but that's another story. We'll leave that for another meeting. Thank you, Commissioner Hudson. Jim, there's a point in words, Commissioner Hudson. <laughs> Um, sorry, Darren, I wasn't giving you, you know, your, your time for um, retort. Um, Vice Chair Kelly. Yeah, just real quick. So in West Contra Costa County, we've had Caltrans, uh, the so-called smart corridor for several years now. And I drive that corridor every day. The ramp metering definitely has helped keep the traffic flowing. That's been good. The variable message signs, they're really helpful when they tell you how far in minutes to your destination. Also, if there happens to be an accident, they can say things like accident four miles ahead right side. So then you can kind of plan on what you need to know. So that's, that's uh, very, very valuable. The signs that tell you how fast to go, I think are absolutely worthless. They'll tell you to slow down to 30 and I'm already going 20. So that's a waste. I do wanna echo one thing that Newell said, um, and that is going from sort of like a freeway to a freeway. In West County, we have uh, Highway 4 going west toward the Golden Gate Bridge. It comes onto I-80 and there is metering there and it really, uh, everything stacks up and a lot of cars just get off and try to go on the local streets and, and try to avoid that. So that's been a big, big problem. Please keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from board members? Okay. Are, have we received any public comments, Terry Ann? No, I've lost Terry Ann. Oh, there she we is. have not received any public comment. Thank you. And are there any members of the public who would like to speak on this item? Please raise your hand and we will call on you. No and public I'm comment. Okay, thank you. Um, so if there are no further comments, I want to say thank you, Darren, and uh, wish you safe travels. And we'll welcome you back again at a future installment of Innovate 680. And Stephanie, thank you very much for continuing to move this um, informative, these informative presentations forward. So, Chair, can I get, just as a point, of, how are you getting home? Do you get to go back? I mean, is, is Australia open? Oh, no, I um, I live in um, the United States. I've lived here for 27 odd years. And no, I can't go home and visit my family right now. I'm going to require a 14 day quarantine when I land in Australia, which makes it very difficult. Plus, you can't get a flight there. There's, there's a cap on how many people can actually fly in every day. So it's very difficult. Well, thank you. Well, safe travels to wherever you're going. Thank you. <laughs> As you're going home and we will welcome you back. All those other things that I said. Um, are still hold true. So, um, okay, so we will now move on to um, agenda item 8B, and it will be presented to us by Hisham Noemi, and it is an action item to seek authorization to program additional federal funds as part of the Safe and Seamless Mobility Quick Strike Program. And Hisham, I saw you. Yes, good evening, yes. Madam Chair and board members. Hopefully you can hear me well. Yeah. My name is Sam Raimi. I'm the Director of Programming at CCTA. About a month ago, MTC approved their staff recommendations for the Safe and Seamless Mobility Quick Strike Program. It included a total funding, the amount of $8.6 million for four projects nominated by CCTA. This amount also included a set aside for the authorities' planning and programming activities. The projects recommended for funding are listed in the staff report for this item. They include Project Enrichment, Lafayette, Concord, as well as at the Pittsburgh BART station. In addition, the recommendations included $700,000 for Giant Road Project in San Pablo, which was nominated directly by MTC. Since the amount recommended for Contra Costa fell a little short of our target by about 1.1 million, Staff worked with MTC to find other ways to fund some of the remaining projects that we nominated. Following several phone calls, emails, and meetings, MTC staff proposed the programming of 1.96 million in one uh, Bay Area grant savings to projects in Contra Costa. And consistent with the authority's funding allocation policy, which prioritizes projects on the allocation plan for funding, staff determined that the following projects are eligible and they can meet the requirements of the fund source 
as well as their funding request can be accommodated by the funding available. The first project is in Pinol. It consists of pedestrian bicycle improvements at APN Way and Merleste Road. We nominated the project for the Quick Strike program, but it was not part of MTC recommendation. We are recommending $350,000 out of the 1.96 million to go to this project. And the second project consists of two segments of San Ramon Valley Boulevard in Danville, San Ramon Valley Boulevard South, as well as San Ramon Valley Boulevard North. Both of them will provide uh, uh, pavement improvements. Funding the two projects will allow reprogramming Measure J funds to the Diablo Road Trail, which is one of the projects we know and nominated for the Quick Strike program. This, of course, assumes that our Measure J revenue forecast that you will see in September supports this action, which we think it will, given all the data that we've seen so far. Unlike the Diablo Trail, uh, Diablo Road Trail projects, these two projects are easy are, can be easily federalized. That is why we're recommending 1.6 million uh, in, in the funding to go to these two projects rather than to put them on the Diablo Road Trail. Note that by funding the projects on the allocation plan with other sources, the authority will be saving $6.6 .6 million in Measure J. This without a doubt will help us fund the other projects that we have in the allocation plan. With that as a background, we are asking for your approval to program the 1.955 million for the two projects, as I described earlier. The EPC uh, recommended approval of this item at their meeting in early July. I want to publicly express my appreciation for the work done by MTC programming staff for responding favorably to our concerns. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any question. Thank you, Hisham. Are there any uh, board members who have questions for Hisham? No. Um, Terry Ann, did we receive any written public comment? None was received. And are there any members of the public who would like to speak to this item? No public comment. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion to- So moved as presented. I'll second, but- Thank you. So we have a motion by Commissioner Arnridge and a second by Commissioner Butt. Um, if no further discussion, Terry Ann, will you please do the roll call vote? Yes. Commissioner Arnridge? Yes. Commissioner Butt? Yes. Commissioner Glover? Yes. Commissioner Haskew? Yes. Commissioner Hudson? Yes. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes. Commissioner Nowak? Yes. Commissioner Thorpe? Aye. Commissioner White? Yes. yes. Vice Chair Kelly? Yes. Chair Geringer? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And thank you again, Hisham. And, um, and thank you for recognizing the MTC staff. And I know that CCTS staff has been working very hard on this to make sure that we get as much value out of all of our funding sources and particular, particularly on the Measure J, so thank you. And moving on to the next item, agenda item 8C, this is an information, a status update and request for input. There's no action. Um, we will hear from Lindsay um, about a strategic communications roadmap development. Good evening, commissioners. I'm going to share my screen here and hopefully you can all see what I'm trying to show you. Yes, great. Um, this year staff has begun working on a strategic communications roadmap. This is a, a work element that we've undertaken um, in part because it's been quite a while since we've done something like this. So I have a brief presentation and I wanna start by taking you down memory lane. So over the past 10 or so years, we've had several major initiatives and I just want to highlight a few that have involved extensive um, public engagement and public outreach with all of our communities in Contra Costa. And actually in 2012 was the first time um, to anyone's uh, recollection that the authority 
you froze. Try to be more visible with the public. In addition to those major initiatives, we also have had several major projects that have gone along and each of these also have their own kind of public outreach elements, although some of them are very specific and related to things like um, environmental review and other types of uh, project requirements that have to be done. And so over the course of the past nine years or so, we've tried a whole host of different communication activities from pop-up events at different community events to telephone town halls. Um, we've continued with printed surveys, which is uh, something that had been done previously um, and dipped our toe into the water of online and social media advertising. But we're entering a new era. We've got a new executive director here at the authority. You know, we are nearly complete with many of our major Measure J capital projects. And the way that people are consuming information has changed drastically over the last 10 years. So it's time for us to start to look forward a little more. And that's what we're here tonight to talk to you about is to kind of lay out the skeleton of a roadmap for the future um, to get your input on it. And I really wanna say thank you and my apologies to the APC members. Um, we had a really robust discussion at APC about some of these items. Um, and I promised you I would slim this section down. So hopefully um, I'm staying true to my word. Um, so for those of you who um, weren't at APC, one of the things we did was go out and talk to some agencies that are similar to us and different than us to ask them what has been working for them or what they would recommend an agency like ours do in the future when it comes to um, being more strategic in our communications with all of the different audiences we have. And you can see some of their answers here. Um, you know, many of them talked about video, about keeping things interactive, and about having kind of a consistent presence with the public. Uh, we talked also at APC about the many different audiences we have as a public agency and the recommendation um, from the APC members was that we should spend some more time focusing on communicating with the general public and with the media um, than to maybe other agencies who are similar to us or some of our partners like transit operators and stakeholder groups. We also talked a little bit about some of the different themes that we use when we talk to the public. And you know, you'll see on your screen about five different themes that kind of guide some of our messaging. Some of them are newer, like redefining mobility. Um, and some of them are older and more consistent, uh, like the partnership with the public and how we talk about the accountability we bring to the work that we do. And you know, these are some recommendations of different types of communication activities um, that we're looking to try in the future. And I think kind of one of the main points here is that we've had all of these different initiatives over the year where we've had a really intense period of public outreach um, and we've spent a lot of dollars. So for example, the 2019 TEP, which is probably one of the most recent efforts, we spent about $750,000. Um, on communicating with the public about that particular effort. But on any given year over the last eight years or so, we only spend about $150,000. So we've had kind of these peaks and valleys in terms of our engagement with the public. And we're really looking at trying to be more consistent and maybe uh, raising that level of engagement, which also requires kind of maybe raising that base level of investment to something closer to 400 or $500,000 a year to be able to stay engaged across a county as, as big and diverse as ours. And so really what we were hoping to hear from you guys tonight is um, what are the different communication activities um, that you think are effective with your constituents and in your communities? And, you know, are we on the right track? Do you, do you think it is something we should look to invest in in the future um, or to make a bigger investment in that? Are those the right audiences we should focus on? Um, essentially, is there anything we're missing 
and I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen because we are planning to come back to you later this year with an actual roadmap for you to read and review that will um, potentially set the stage for an RFP for some communications contracts in the future. But we didn't want to uh, come to you with something fully baked. We really wanted your, your input um, and to get your feedback. So with that, I'm, I'm happy to stop talking and start listening. Okay, and Commissioner Hudson, thank, thank you, Lindsay. And um, yes, we had a very robust discussion and um, determined that with this many uh, this many boxes full of people that it might be harder to do that, but very much do want input. And so first we have Commissioner Hudson, then Commissioner Butt. Now are the hands I see up so far. I, so I, the first thing that I looked at, Lindsay, because I've gone to a couple of these with you, did you see any drastic differences in the, for example, the focus group or, a, I don't know, next door or whatever it is where, 80% uh, of the people said do a half percent sales tax and 20% at the next one said do a half a percent. Sale. I mean, was there any real drastic difference or was it more like, okay, we did different things and we reached different people, but they said the same thing. I don't think we saw a huge difference across the year, but uh, the years over what people said. I think we've tried these different varieties of methods to, to make those input opportunities more accessible to folks. You know, we've tried to go where they are at community events. Um, we've tried telephone town halls that allow people to kind of call in and listen and speak their mind from the comfort and convenience of their own home or, or work if they're still there. Um, you know, we've looked at, a, at uh, different ways of, you know, um, interactive surveys, letting people drop things on maps. And, and I think it's what we have done is try to cast a really wide net. I, I don't think that one particular method has given us uh, drastically different answers or responses from another. So for example, when we um, were doing our countywide transportation plan a few years ago, we surveyed folks using a variety of methods, an online survey tool, a printed tool, in-person pop-up events, telephone town halls, and the message we got from the public was fairly consistent. We just gave them many more avenues to share that with us. Well, the, the only two cents I'll add, because I'd like to hear what APC has to say about they They got the full presentation, the full discussion. Uh, to me, whenever you're going to go to something and hand something to somebody, you almost have to focus on uh, no more than three things as uh, if they leave, they know you did this three things we've done or maybe three things that we could do if we got more money. Um, just to keep it simple in the messaging because you know I just assume everybody's a genius and knows how smart we are but apparently I, I, I read the room wrong when it came to the vote. But I don't know where to go from here. I think it, it's like, we, I, I don't know if anybody's done more than what you guys have done. And I sit on the air district. I mean, it's like, uh, what do you have to do? Walk into their house and and uh, and drop a, a net sheet or something on their dinner table? I I don't know. I'd like to hear what APC had to say. Thanks, Dave. Um, Commissioner Butt. Well, this is a fascinating subject. You know, whether you're a, a business or a public agency or a political candidate or a, or an elected official. Um, you know, this is this is your biggest challenge is how to reach the public. And I, I, I think as we go down this road with maybe a fresh look at it, a couple of things are important. One of them is to figure out where people get their news or get their information. You know, we don't we know they don't get it from newspapers anymore because they pretty much don't exist. So they're going to they're going to other other media. And I guess the second thing is that if you're serious about this and we're gonna put some time and effort and money into it, uh, it would be good to, to build in some kind of a feedback loop so that, so that we know whether our message is getting across and, and whether we're trending toward being a more effective communicator or whether Nobody's listening. Nobody cares. It doesn't matter what you do. It's not going to make any any difference. So, you know, if it's something something you could you could do some kind of 
a focus group or polling or something every, I don't know, every six months, every year, and then benchmark it against the previous one to see if we're actually uh, making some in inroads into this. It's a tough subject. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Butt. Anyone else? Does anyone from APC want to, and, and chair chair of APC, Commissioner Argerich? Yeah, I would, I would just add that, um, you know, when you look at our agency, um, we have went from being virtually unknown, no media, to the steps to engage. Um, and clearly we engaged um, um, through the original Measure J, did a great message there, a good job. But it was a different time in how people, as, as um, Dave Hudson said, um, and Tom said, people got their, their news differently. Um, that was a long time ago. But we've done a good job of pivoting to find those different venues, but we're not quite there. So I think what Lindsay's been presenting is that we're on the journey and it's not over. And what we did last year, it's no different than we all look at our own downtowns and we go, wow, what we did five years ago worked at that time, but what, what needs to be done today has no relationship. The rules are changed, the, the expectations are different. So um, I, I think what we're really just saying in, in general is that we're going to continue to evolve and change without asking questions of people, the public, other agencies, what has been successful, what hasn't, to then come back with a more comprehensive plan. And guess what? That will last for a couple of years and we'll be doing it again. Um, the, the lesson is, is that in, in communicating what we do and how we do it, um, it has had a tiny bit of success. The fact is most people don't know CCTA. They don't know that we did the call. They don't know those things. And so we're trying to discover a roadmap to find those ways to get that message and engage people. Because every time we've done it, people go, oh, yeah, I didn't know that. That's a great idea. Oh, but you don't have another idea. So as Tom and Dave both said, we have to have a way to make sure we get feedback. We have to, we have to acknowledge that feedback and we have to respond back to it. We can't just put information and expect people to sit there and listen. Um, we need to hear back from people and um, I think we'll be a better agency for it. And, and the more we do that, you know, as they say, one bad customer, uh, one good customer will get you 10, one bad customer these days will cost you a thousand to a million. Um, you know, it used to be a hundred, but because of the internet, it's gone when it's bad. So um, anyway, I think we're on the right path and it's just, by the way, we're still working on this. So uh, Lindsay's and her team are just going to move forward um, and take us along that journey. And everybody is looking for input along that way. Um, uh, feedback is what I think we have to focus on. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Nowak. Yeah, thanks. Um, a couple of things I think we talked about at APC, and correct me if I'm wrong on these, but one of the things I think we discussed is uh, today's communication is kind of short and sweet. It's got to be small bites, but getting the information out there. And, you know, one of the, I haven't been on CCTA that long, but per TransPAC and looking at previous communication, it's very lengthy, a lot of words, and the public doesn't have time for that these days. They want something short and sweet, social media, something they can read quickly on their phone and get that information. Um, you know, a quick blurb on a status update on, you know, what's going on at 680, things like that. The other thing is communicating to a lot of the public that doesn't commute on 680. Mm -hmm. what, if you focus so much on 680, you are gonna lose, you know, probably half the people in Pleasant Hill don't ever get on 680. They may go to 24 but they don't get to 680. So if we keep focusing on that, but having to bring it back to what is it gonna to do to our local roads? Is moving on 680 gonna improve the congestion in Pleasant Hill being, you know, sort of in between four or 680 and 24. Uh, so also communicating with them on a different level for those people that aren't commuters really. Um, so those are, I think, two of the points that we discussed um, at APC. Thank you. Commissioner Hudson, and then I was going to just share a couple of notes. Oh, okay, I, you know, I'm wondering if it's worth it just to find out. I mean, Newell tweaked something. I was thinking about it. That 
They don't know we did Calcutt. We don't know we did something. And I'm wondering if it isn't worth trying uh, a direct mail to three of the cities that just spoke and, and see if there's any, no, just seriously. And somewhere in the one that goes to Pleasant Hill is a quote, as soon as I tells you, this is what we did. Pictures just to me are, are worth a, a thousand words, but it's like, what have we done in our own community pitching what we've done? I mean, I, I know Newell and I have sat there till we're blue in the face about traffics, but it's along those lines, if you send something out uh, with a you know fifty to a, maybe a hundred words of uh, this is why CCTA is good, Newell Armory, this is why Sue Noack or Tom Butt, and see if it makes a difference. Does it move the needle? Uh, I know that when you put everything that you do, you aren't moving anything because after the first three or four things, I can't tell you what's on that information sheet. But I love those little icon things that you had to begin with, and it. I said, if we can make that recognizable that it's CCTA and we've done something, and then you just had an article about that you, Tim sent me about uh, Innovate 680. I mean, is there something there worth doing it? I don't know what it costs. Then the problem becomes you can't do it during election time. So you're gonna have to do it pretty darn quick. Uh, but I have always thought if the people that are recognizable in their cities are behind this, and telling you in you know, pretty little words that, hey, we are doing something out there that's good. It might be worth uh, moving the needle two or three points, and that's what we've got to do. Get you know, we don't get any money. We're gone in what so many years. So, I, I think it's worth considering. I don't know if you have to go the full blown little uh, eight page paper or something like that, but I mean, we need to start using the resource we haven't used, and that's us. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Nowak, did you have another comment or just? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on, on, on Dave's comment quickly. Um, I, you know, I think one of the effective things that's happened in Pleasant Hill is our, our police department has been putting out little short things on what they've been doing in the community, whether it's an, a recent arrest or things like that. They're not trying to sell themselves. They, you know, it's really a here's an information blip. And it's done tremendous things in the city for people's outlook about our police force. And if we could do that, here's an update, quick update on Facebook that shows what's going on on 680 and, and you know something like that, instead of a sales pitch, really here's what's going on, all of us could share it. And you know that gets, when we start sharing things on Facebook or Twitter, it hits all our constituents and they can see it quickly, a picture, a quick comment, and you get, get some recognition. So I just wanted to follow quickly up on Dave's comment with that. Thank you. And some of the other um, items that we talked about, and so several of you have uh, touched on them, but was not, not to be really out there necessarily selling, but in, in a way that we can do it to say, what, what are we doing? And I'm looking at Commissioner Thorpe because he was also very much a part of this conversation, but what, what have you done for me? And we're really good when we're out there, you know, working on our um, measures or our community, you know, transportation plans, all of those things. We um, are very good at that, but how do we keep that message going? And so we talked a little bit about, um, as has been mentioned, you know, having those little sound bites either through social media or that we as board members can get out, but also through some experiences, through being out and partnering with the colleges, through just a lot of different um, brainstorming went on that day. And I did see some of that, thank you, Lindsay, uh, captured in your presentation and for us to be able to build on. And that putting the sort of public forward facing uh, outreach at the top of our list. We're really good at, I think it was Tim or somebody having the insider baseball of the transportation industry. So with our other agencies and with other transportation agencies, we're really good at that. And that's where we know, but it's how do we take that, um, the positives of us and take it out there into the community. And I think there was, yes, yeah, some, some other pieces around experiences and I was trying to see if there was any other. Yeah, that was kind of kind of where we were. So I think, Lindsay, we have 
you know, getting us getting us started and getting this input, and it will be an iterative process. And um, do you have other questions for us, Lindsay, or prompts or? No, I think we just wanted to kind of get um, get a sense from the larger group if there was anything we were missing, if we were on the right track, and I, you know, I think to respond to a few of the, the comments, you know, definitely. Uh, measurement and feedback mm -hmm. is part of that. One of the agencies we interviewed actually pulls every six months and then they spend the next six months crafting all of their messaging in response to what they heard from folks. And then they do it again on an iterative basis. So I think there were um, a lot of good ideas uh, that maybe you didn't see in that presentation because we were trying to keep it short and sweet, but you <laughs> will see come out in a, in a larger roadmap that you get to view in the future. Great, thank you. And I know they have a couple of op-eds and ideas in the works as well. So, um, so, and you know where they are. So if any other authority board members have any input for um, uh, Lindsay or uh, Tim or the team as it moves forward, they will be welcome to hear that. So thank you, Lindsay. Um, and thank you, the APC members as well. Um, moving on. Um, oh, Terri Ann, did we receive any public comments on this item? No public comment was received. And are there any members of the public who want to speak to this? I'm not seeing any public comment. I'm not either. So um, thank you very much. And now we'll move on to agenda item number nine, our planning committee items. And the next item on the agenda is an action item. It'll be presented by John Wang to seek authorization to enter into an agreement with Streetlight Data for a countywide multi-domain license and a memorandum of understanding with the cities and towns participating uh, in the cost share for the license. So, John. Good evening, Chair Gerniger and uh, board members. Uh, the only thing I want to add to this item is that, as you noted, in, as noted in the staff report, between the PC meeting uh, back on July 1st and this meeting tonight, we did add one city, so that's why the change from seven cities and towns to eight. So that's a great news for us. Uh, we always wanna get more participation. Uh, so with that, um, I will take any questions. Okay. So do any, um, and I see Commissioner Nowak. So any comments from the board on John's very detailed presentation, actually his very detailed staff report. Commissioner Nowak. I just had a quick question. Um, were all the city engineers contacted and approached to participate? Yes, uh, Commissioner Nowak, yes. We did an extensive Great. outreach to all the Great. Great, thank you. Thank you. Great question. It's my understanding that this the negotiate the the outreach has been going on for a while to get us to this point. So any other questions? No. Terry Ann, have we received any written public comment on this item? No written public comment has been received. Are there any members of the public who would like to comment or speak on this item now? Please raise your hand. Move staff recommendation on 569. No public comment. Okay, thank you. And we have a motion for the staff recommendation by Commissioner Hudson. May I have a second? Second. Okay, and a second by Vice Chair Kelly. Um, Terry M, will you please call the vote? Yes. Commissioner Arnrich? Yes. Commissioner Butt? Yes. Commissioner Glover? Yes. Commissioner Haskew? Yes. Commissioner Hudson? Yes. Yep. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Commissioner Nowak? Yes. Commissioner Thorpe? Aye. Commissioner White? Yes. Vice Chair Kelly. Yes. Chair Geringer. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Great. And thank you, John, for all the work that's been happening on this. And I personally can't wait to start seeing all that data. So um, moving on to the next agenda item, 9B, that um, will be presented. It is an action item. It'll be presented by Matt Kelly to seek approval to forward the draft 2021 congestion management program to the RTPCs and other interested parties for review and comment. Matt. 
Thank you, Chair Geringer, and good evening, uh, Authority Board members. Uh, Matt Kelly, Senior Transportation Planner at CCTA. Um, as the Congestion Management Agency for Contra Costa County, CCTA is uh, legislatively required to prepare and update a congestion management program every two years. We've done this since way back in 1991, so this will be our 15th update of the CMP. As I've told you over the years, if you've been here for more than one cycle, you'll know that the growth management program, which is part of Measure J, uh, fulfills uh, basically all of the requirements of the congestion management program. Um, so we do defer to the growth management program when uh, updating our congestion management program. Uh, so the CMP must, uh, it does have some guidelines. Um, it must demonstrate consistency with the adopted RTP. Um, so we need to make sure uh, we demonstrate that we are fully aligned with Plan Bay Area 2040. However, we did that in our 2019 document. And since uh, Plan Bay Area 2040 is the current RTP, we don't have to uh, demonstrate any new consistency there. So uh, the 2021 update, we are approaching it as a technical update focused on bringing it up to date with any changes since 2019. Um, we really wanted to focus on the monitoring of the CMP system, which includes 65 intersections around the county and all of our freeways. Uh, this allows us to look at uh, changes in traffic patterns over time. Um, we collect bike and pedestrian counts at all of those intersections. Um, what we'll be doing with that information is releasing a monitoring report in the fall. And we'll also be uh, publishing a dashboard, an online dashboard, where you or your city staff or whoever can go look on there and look at how traffic has changed around the county um, yeah, uh, over time. So it, it should be a, a pretty cool interactive uh, tool there that we'll provide. Uh, but this year, um, like I said, we're focused on just making technical updates um, to the document. This is consistent with MTC's 21, 2021 CMP guidance. Uh, they're not suggesting people overhaul their CMPs this time, just make technical updates. Um, but something new we are introducing uh, in not in the plan, but kind of as an external uh, uh, um, uh, implementation uh, part of the CMP would be possibility of opting out of the congestion management program. Um, this is something that we've not talked about real seriously over the years, but um, lately we've been talking about it more at the, at the regional level. Different CMAs have been thinking about, well, would it make sense to opt out of the CMA? And I, I think for CM, for CCTA, because we have the growth management program, it makes sense to at least look into it. So um, while the draft CMP is out there, we're going to be talking with MTC staff as well as other, two other uh, CMAs in the Bay Area um, to see what it would take to opt out and if it's um, would be beneficial to us. We don't want to lose out on anything we currently get from MTC in terms of pass through state and, and uh, federal funds. Um, you know, we've talked to Sonoma County who opted out uh, a decade or more ago. They haven't lost any access to funds. Um, LA, uh, LA County just opted out through their LA Metro um, last year. They've assured us they're doing fine. Um, so, but we will investigate that. We won't uh, bring that forward as a recommendation if we don't feel it's it's uh, in our best interests. But um, that is something we'll be working on at the staff level over the next uh, few months. Um, and so, um, like I said, we'll bring that back with the adoption of the final CMP, and that occurs in December. So, and a detailed schedule for the adoption is included in the staff report. Um, so, our recommendation tonight is is really just to release the draft 21. 2021 CMP for comment and review through the RTPCs uh, with comments due uh, in early October. So that's my report and I can take any questions. Great, thank you very much. Do we have any questions from authority board members? Okay, Terry Ann, do we have any written comments? No written public comment. Are there any members of the public who would like to comment on this item? Please raise your hand and we will call on you. 
no public comments. Okay, thank you. Uh, may I have? I'll move the board release the draft to the RTPCs and interested parties for review and comment. Thank you, Commissioner Hudson. A second? I'll second it. Thank you, Commissioner Haskew. Terry Ann, will you please call conduct the roll call vote? Yes. Commissioner Ardrich? Yes. Commissioner Butt? Thumbs up. Thank you. Commissioner Glover? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Haskew? Yes. Commissioner Hudson? Yes. Another, another thumbs up. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Mitchoff? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Nowak? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Thor? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner White? Yes. Thank you. Vice Chair Kelly? Yes. Thank you. Chair Geringer? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. And thank you very much, Matt. And um, we, I know we'll be getting this back to us in a future time. So thank you. And moving on to agenda item number 9C, um, we're going to receive an update and then we have a couple of action items. And so it'll be presented by Peter Ingle to provide an update on the Accessible Transportation Strategic Plan. We'll open it up for nominations and selection of one authority board member to serve on the task force and seek approval for the chair to execute a letter requesting priority funding from the county's Measure X Community Advisory Board meeting. And so Peter's going to do the presentation. I did see that uh, John Cunningham from Contra Costa County is also here. Great, thank, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for giving my staff report tonight. I, I basically was just gonna say what you just said. We're, we're providing an update. We have two action items. Um, we, one of the things during the, during the development of the Accessible Transportation Strategic Plan was that we need to find new funding if we want to implement this plan. So an opportunity has been provided to us through um, Contra Costa County's Measure X um, sales tax measure, um, and we will be um, doing a presentation um, to, the, to the Community Advisory Committee Board on July 28th, making a funding request to help support the short-term uh, implementation of the Accessible um, Transportation Strategic Plan. And um, recommendation from county staff was that we get a letter from CCTA who would help um, you know, support that request. So that is, that is one of the action items we're looking for tonight. The other item is um, something that's changed since the planning committee originally we had um, planned on having two representatives from CCTA. Um, one of the other changes that we made for the task force was that we wanted to add a representation from each of the four RTPCs. And um, since the planning committee looking at it, since the planning committee meeting, looking at it a little closer, um, we realized that we were going to potentially have some Brown Act issues with with quorum of the authority. Um, if we had two CCTA appointees because of the basically the makeup of the RTPCs and the representation at CCTA. So at this time, we are looking for one appointment to um, the task force from CCTA and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, so are there any, and all of this material was in the staff report. Are there any questions or comments for Peter or for John? Um, do we receive any written comments, Terry Ann, before we go on to the action items? No written public comment. And are there any members of the public who would like to make a comment? Please raise your hand. Oh, um, Commissioner Mitchell. Oh, well, there you go. Well, no, I, I, I'm I ready to move. Moving on to the next oh. item. Do we have any nominations for the authority board seat on the task force? Yes, Madam Chair, I would move the appointment of Teresa Geringer as our chair. Well, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, D Dave Hudson, did you second that? Yes. Okay. You can call me ask you. <laughs> um, so we have a motion um, and um, a second on the, on the table on the floor. Um, do we have any other nominations for this um, authority board seat on the task force? 
Seeing no other hands raised, Terry Ann, will you please conduct the roll call vote? Commissioner Arnrich? Yes. Commissioner Butt? Yes. Commissioner Glover? Yes. Commissioner Haskew? Aye. Commissioner Hudson? Yes. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes. Commissioner Nowak? Yes. Commissioner Thorpe? Aye. Commissioner White? Aye. Vice Chair Kelly? Yes. Chair Geringer? Aye. Okay. Motion passes to appoint Chair Geringer to the Accessible Transportation Task Force, Strategic Plan Task Force. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, if you, yes. <laughs> and if you can say it. So thank you very much. I do look forward to continuing the work. I did serve on the um, committee. Um, the PAC and um, look forward to working with those who will be appointed in your various other entities to, to keep up the momentum and to actually move this work forward. So thank you. And thank you, Peter and John for continuing to, to push on this and um, to keep us moving. Can I just for clarify? For a meeting in late September or October. <laughs> so. Can I also clarify that the motion did also include authorization for the chair to execute the letter to the county? Yes, it did. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You can have the vice chair sign it if you want. <laughs> all of these, all of our mini hats. So thank you very much. So moving on to agenda item 9D. Um, this is an Sorry, information. Nope. Go ahead. I, I thought the motion was just to appoint not to... Uh, uh, do that uh, letter to the county. To approve the letter to the county. Okay, so we can have a separate motion. So yes. let's do that. Thank you, Commissioner Thiller. So do I have a motion to approve the letter? So moved. Thank second. you, Commissioner Arnrich, and second by mm -hmm. no, Commissioner Nowak. Mitchoff. Mitchoff, thank you. Um, Terry, uh -huh. will you call a vote? Sorry, I try to look for the little yellow highlighted boxes, but. <laughs> it works. Uh, Commissioner Arnrich? Yes. Commissioner Butt? Yes. Commissioner Glover? Yes. Commissioner Haskew? Yes. Commissioner Hudson? Yes. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes. Commissioner Nowak? Yes. Commissioner Thorpe? No. Nope. Commissioner White? Yes. Yes. Vice Chair Kelly? Yes. Chair Geringer? Aye. Okay, motion passes with a majority vote with Thorpe voting no for the uh, Chair Geringer to sign the letter to the county. Thank you. And thank you for um, clarifying that and making sure that we're dotting our I's and crossing our T's. And so now we will move, move on to agenda item number 9D. And this is an informational item that will be presented by John Wong. And I'm pronouncing this wrong. I don't know why tonight I'm having a hard time with it, John, to discuss the development of the countywide transportation plan update. Thank you. Yes, good evening, Chair Geringer and Commissioners. Again, John Wong, Director of Planning. I have a short presentation, which I will share. Um, let me see, let me show my screen here. Can you all see it? Can you see the presentation? Okay, thank you. Um, for this item, uh, this will be the first of many uh, item uh, meetings that I'll be presenting on the countywide transmission plan update. Uh, as you know, uh, based on the um, well, first of all, I want to I want to kind of clarify and and explain. So, the couple items ago, you heard Matt present about the CMP, which is the Congestion Management Program. That's a two year plan uh, plan that we do uh, primarily to monitor the CMP network. So, as you know, if you've been at, with uh, on the board for a while, you know that we do a countywide transportation plan also, and that gets updated every four to five years. So tonight, I just want to kick off. A, um, a presentation to kind of look out what it is that we're going to be doing with the CTP over the next couple of years. The, uh, as part of the sales tax measure C and J, we established the growth management program. 
And as part of that, we're responsible, CCTA is responsible for updating this CTP. And the requirements is uh, that we develop a, a, a transportation infrastructure that's needed to mitigate transportation impacts generated by new developments. And also we want to establish, establish a cooperative planning process requiring that all cities and the county work together on developing uh, sub area plans that are brought together for the CTP. Uh, this process will include an extensive public outreach um, effort. Uh, these are goals that you all should be familiar with. These are taken off of the last uh, transportation expenditure plan, basically covering uh, the overarching goal of relieving traffic congestion, um, improving uh, transit, making transit more accessible and more efficient, and providing access and safe transportation for all, and also improving transportation within our communities. And again, these are taken directly from the TEP. So essentially, we're not starting from scratch here. This is the seventh update that we'll be doing. And uh, we do have a, the TEP um, outcome to, uh, as a starting point uh, as we move forward. This is the development process. We started this month reaching out to the RTPCs, uh, laying out the schedule, updating the action plan is one of the first items. We'll take about a year to do, to reach out to uh, work with all the cities through the RTPCs. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and then as Lindsay mentioned, uh, with the public outreach uh, portion, there's gonna be um, uh, some, some detailed and some extensive public outreach for the plan, uh, starting with the travel behavior study that's going to be going on this fall, and uh, your typical public engagement and stakeholders outreach. Uh, we don't want to only reach out to the advocates, but also reach out to the general public and try to get a good round uh, um, feel, uh, input from all. Uh, as part of the CTP, there will be a um, development of an environmental impact report. The whole process uh, is expected to take two years, um, ending in June of two, 2023. These are all elements and, uh, that you are familiar with already, and I'm not going to go through every single one of them, but um, essentially, these programs and projects we're currently doing right now, and uh, we will be enhancing, modifying, improving as we put the CTP together. Uh, again, it's basically looking at traffic congestion, relief, accountability, transparency, and really emphasizing and, and, and moving forward with the innovation technology side. We have new elements that we're considering in the CTP also, including vehicles mile travel and really focusing on vision zero and autonomous vehicles as such. So for tonight's, uh, for the purpose of tonight's presentation was to initiate the discussion uh, of the CTP update process. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there'll be many more opportunities for the authority and the commissioners to um, provide input throughout the process. Uh, well, that concludes my presentation and I would like to open this up for questions comments and discussions. I'm gonna take my screen down. Thank you. All right, and Commissioner Nowak and then Commissioner Butt. So my big question is, you know, with all of us facing our new housing element with, you know, massive increases, um, I think Pleasant Hill is 1800 when we only have 10,000 units. So much of the public's questions are, what are you gonna do with traffic? What are you gonna do with traffic? And so, I hope we're taking into consideration as we work on this plan, what, what all of our cities are having to face as far as having to zone for massive increasing in housing. Um, and so that the plan can reflect what we're gonna need to do in order to accommodate that as well. John, Tim. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's a definitely, uh, oh, I, I, sorry, that, that's definitely a big concern. As you all know, the reading the numbers came out and 
and Contra Costa County it really took on a brunt of the increase in housing. So that's going to be a huge factor in how we move forward um, to address uh, the increased traffic expect expected for the future. Thank you. Commissioner Butt. Uh, the, the goals you put up, I, I understand they're preliminary and they're left over from the last time this was done, but, uh, you know, I, I think a significant omission, unless I missed it, was, was something about sustainability and reducing greenhouse gases and, and uh, global warming and, and, you know, all those kinds of things. Yes, uh, I may have in, inadvertently left that off, but that's the that's actually one of the major elements of the uh, of the whole CCP and the consideration of uh, reduced greenhouse gas reduction of BMT uh, sustainability. That's all going to be a part of the CCP. And thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. The point of order: We did bring it up at the PC meeting. Okay, so we'll make, thank you for, for um, pointing that out and we'll make sure that that is there. Any other comments or questions? Uh, yes, Representative Allen. Thank you, I, I, I still don't have a raise hand function uh, at every, okay. so I, I put the clap hands up. I was hoping you'd see me. Um, <laughs> So I wanted to just, uh, I was wondering if you could uh, take us back to, um, and, and I don't think your slides had numbers on them, but uh, there was one that mentioned BART as uh, one of the, it was about, I don't know, halfway through. Is that, is it possible for you to put those back up or if not, in the TEP. there you go. Uh, so before this, Okay. Go backwards. Okay. And one more, the one before this. So these these are good goals, and I, I'm I'm bringing us back to this because I think that the um, the narrative that I heard was slightly different than what we see here on this screen, and I I want to clarify this for on, on behalf of Bart. Uh, bullet point number two, make bus, ferry, passenger, train, and BART rides safer, cleaner, and more reliable. Now, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the first three, but I am going to speak on this with respect to BART. Um, we are in the process of trying to lure back uh, riders to BART. We're sitting at about 21% of our pre-pandemic ridership. And I talk to people uh, pretty much on a daily basis between phone calls and emails and other social media posts, uh, BART writers and people who are not BART writers. And um, the number one theme that I hear over and over and over is if you want people to get out of their cars and go back to BART, the things you see here on the slide are what will get them there. And it is safe, clean, and reliable. And I usually add one more in, and that's affordable. Um, there, are, there is a large population of former BART riders. And the only way we're going to get them back is to focus on these things. So I'm hoping that in this next um, planning round that we go through here in our county anyway, that we will focus any money that we plan to send to BART on, on, on making sure they are tied to these three things. And there was a little bit of this theme in, in the last measure, uh, which unfortunately did not pass. Um, but I think that we need to make it more specific as to where any BART money is going to go to. Uh, because I think sometimes very broad terms like access are used and when those broad terms are used, then BART uh, has really a long list of definitions that, that fit into that category. So that's, that's my input here, at least at the very beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for that Thank you. Thank you for that input. Anyone else? 
keep looking around and I'm not seeing any. And as John pointed out during his, oh, excuse me, Commissioner Worth or Representative Worth. For, no, forgive me. I, I just I just wanted to jump in for at last minute. You know, I kind of wanted to echo Deborah's comments, you know, and those goals didn't come out of the desk last week. I think it's important to know, don't John has robustly knows what the work that we've done historically. And we talked earlier about communicating with our residents and th those concepts about safe, clean, reliable, that comes right out of extensive polling that where we really drill down with our residents to find out what their priorities are. And those transit priorities as, as, as you know, John put them out there are exactly what our, our, our residents have said they, they want. And, you know, my sense is from the COVID in the last, you know, year and a half, the last two years of time that's elapsed since we did that polling, those views are probably even more intensely felt uh, than they were. So I, I do think it creates a great framework for us. I also think just from a regional perspective, those goals really tie in with sort of the regional priorities in terms of funding and, you know, down the road. So I think it's also really important as we're competing with funds regionally that we do have, you know, a platform in these goals that really tie in with, with, with those too. So I think it's, it's great. And it seemed like just yesterday we were, we were doing this. So it's, it, I mean, it's always really an important process to go through and it, it provides also an opportunity to talk with voters in a meaningful way. And I think that's the other thing when we communicate, you, you know, focusing on this, this plan is, is really a great way to not only put information out, but get their input. So thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or input? And I was starting to say, we will, as John pointed out, have many opportunities. And thank you, um, Representative Worth, for pointing out how it does intersect and cross over with the strategic communications plan and work that uh, Lindsay presented earlier. So um, are there, Terri Ann, did we receive any written comments on this item? No written public comment. And I will ask again, even though I haven't looked at the list to see if members of the public actually joined us, but if are there any members of the public who would like to make a comment on this item, please raise your hand. No public comments. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to, um, thank you again, John, for this, um, for, you, for this report and presentation. And I know we'll see you many times as we work through this. Um, we're moving on to agenda item number uh, 10, correspondence and communications. We don't have any, any committee reports were added to your uh, packet and handouts. So we'll move down to uh, agenda item number 12, authority board and staff comments, chair comments and reports. The chair is starting to stumble over her words for some reason, but anyway, um, I did just wanna uh, say that um, we had a great, and probably uh, someone else or Tim may speak about this as well, but I wanted to thank Lindsay and Tim and Jack for um, a great tour at Gomentum. I hadn't been out there for probably four years, lots of changes. The investment that the authority board has made in partnership with AAA is, uh, can, can definitely be seen. Um, we saw from afar the glideways, two of the glideways, glide cars. Um, and just, um, it was, was really very informative. And it was also um, a tour in partnership with Contra Costa County and the administrator and a member of her staff. And um, I know that Supervisor Glover, Supervisor Mitchell was also signed up, but um, had another commitment um, today. So um, it um, was a great opportunity to be out there and look at the partnerships. And are there any other uh, commissioners or representatives who have comments on reports or activities and meetings. Please raise your hand, Ms. Commissioner Hudson. Yeah, I had a nice five hour Bay Area Air Quality Management District meeting today. No I comments. I understand, Supervisor Mitch. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Amy, any updates on? Or Commission uh, Representative Worth. <laughs> no. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, you know, we we've had some very productive meetings um, over the last month with regards to the regional plan. 
making sure that all the programs and projects for Contra Costa County are are um, there where they need to be, and um, also I uh, our you know the public comment period for the plan for the EIR is, is closed, and now uh, we will you know staff will do the analysis and the response to those comments. Uh, the um, and of course Dave gets to take on Dave and Karen I guess get to take on the Rena process, which will begin now through the appeal process and then ultimately ABAG will approve the RENA plan and then collectively MTC includes the, will approve the entire plan, which is a combination of the countywide transportation plan, as well as um, the RENA that gets all put together under SB 375 and all goes together in one comprehensive plan. So the the question I think that's an important one that Sue raised about transportation in the arena. Um, there is a lot of discussion in the regional plan. And uh, obviously with the increased arena, uh, you know, the, the um, I'll follow up at our, at our staff level on that. Cause I think that's a really good question um, because obviously the, the, the plans are developed in parallel. So, um, and of course the cities will then begin the planning after that plan approves and then have a couple of years, you know, significant time to just do the planning for it. And then of course, at the same time, you wanna be looking at the transportation piece of it. So I'll be back at the next month to maybe give a little bit more input in from the, at least from the MTC perspective on how people envision transportation investments uh, to accom accommodate that, but that's been one of our real pushes and, uh, you know, uh, is to ensure that Contra Costa has the transportation investments that also, you know, that accompany these, these RENA numbers. And for decades, we have taken on a large percentage of housing. And uh, it's really important that our residents, and we are the largest, we're the county that produces the largest number of out commuters. So these regional investments are really important to us. You know, the 680, 80 for these and the, all the transit programs that accompany those in terms of ways. So long story short, we're still working at it. Thank you. Um, Representative Allen. Yeah, I just want to mention um, in case uh, I want to make sure everyone knows that BART is returning to midnight closing uh, as of August 2nd. And next week, there will be some late night trains for the games. So uh, if you uh, have any bulletins that go out from your cities that uh, if you haven't already been contacted by our BART outreach teams, um, feel free to reach out to me as well. My email is my name, deborah.allen at bart.gov. Uh, it's with an O, no H. And uh, as well, for some of the newer members on this, um, on this commission, uh, if you are a city council member or, or a county supervisor or other elected official and you're hearing from constituents about BART complaints, I often have, they are often forwarded to me and I do often forward them on to the right people. So if, if you happen to encounter any of those, um, feel free to send those on to me as well. Thanks. Thank you. Any other commissioner or mm -hmm. representative reports? Okay. Commissioner um, Glover wanna speak? Oh, Commissioner Glover. No, I, but I will just add that I did have an opportunity to join with you uh, today uh, at Momentum, along with uh, Pittsburgh City Council member Holland White, our, our commissioner. Um, and I will say that there's there's been some changes, had an opportunity to visit there early and uh, pretty excited about what our opportunities are gonna be there at Gomenum. So wanted to, uh, to, to share that. And Vice Chair Kelly, if I didn't mention the names of other people who attended, was also there. So thank you. Going once, going twice. Okay, moving on to item uh, agenda item 12C, Tim, executive staff comments. Tim. Thank you. thank you, Madam Chair. And so first of all, I wanna make sure everyone knows that yes, we had a tour today. It was really, really great. 
Um, it was really focused on with working with the county for the expansion of momentum stations um, out at Byron Airport, Buchanan, as well as expanding our, their program into our program. So um, it was really focused on the county, but I want, rest assured, um, we are planning a number of tours um, basically from now until probably through September. So that way we can have all of the commissioners go out to Gomentum Station and see all the new changes. And so we'll probably be doing that probably in groups of, you know, three to four commissioners. Um, so that way, again, everyone can, we can kind of meet everyone's availability and needs and get everyone out there to see all the great improvements and everything's been done on, at Gomentum Station over the last, last couple of years. Um, I also wanted to really echo what Representative Worth was saying. Um, we've had a number of meetings with uh, MTC staff, as well as our regional partners, both in Alameda County, Solano County, and really focusing on, you know, what's happening with Plan Bay Area, the RTP, and, the, and what's happening regionally. If you look at Plan Bay Area right now, um, and you look at the the tr major transit investments that are being planned in the RTP, there is a ring around the around basically the bay, and essentially East Contra Costa is basically or East Bay in general and Contra Costa County has essentially been left off the map. And so one of the conversations that we've been happening in both um, Representative Worth and Commissioner Glover, we met with MTC staff and really push the issue in terms of this constant absorbing of the Reina housing for the Bay Area, but then we're not getting the jobs in Contra Costa County, which all that does is increase VMT, increases congestion. And so we really need to have more focused planning and focused funding into Contra Costa County for transit and for other modes of transportation, uh, because we can't continue obviously rely on the car with all of this continued, um, you know, single occupant driving and, and, and congestion caused by all the housing that we're supposed to really take on here in Contra Costa County. So that is a, a very constant discussion and we'll be continuing following up with MTC staff as we continue to go through that. We actually, CCTA did submit a comment letter yesterday on Plan Bay area to that effect, um, to kind of memorialize our, our comments and feedback um, on Plan Bay area 2050. And I think it's also kind of reinforces a lot of the discussions that we continue to have with our transit operators. Um, we had a really good conversation with our partners at Alameda, uh, Solano and Santa Clara about the vision of transit in the corridor um, and that was, a re that, was, that was a really, really good, robust discussion. And then what was interesting about that, there's a lot, of, a lot of focus on transit, I think, as all of you know. And so that led into a presentation that I was invited to by the East Bay Leadership Council um, with, with my colleagues, uh, Tess Langell, as well as Rick Ramesier. Um, as, and, and we talked a lot about, you know, what the vision of transit is going to be you know, in the 680 corridor and other parts of the county as well. So transit continues to be a really focused discussion um, and it continues to happen. We just had another meeting with MTC staff actually today to really seek funding for, um, the, uh, for the integrated transit plan for the county. Um, and that's gonna be a really important component as the Blue Ribbon Task Force is gonna be coming out with their recommendations soon. Um, and so we're really trying to get ahead of that and being really proactive. Um, at CCTA, you know, I, I think we all pride ourselves of being an employer of choice and, and really taking professional development very seriously. We, we try to make sure that everyone is, has the opportunity to go to training and conferences and those types of things. And so was really had the pleasure and really excited to congratulate Lindsay Willis and Stephanie Hu for graduating from the CalCog. California Academy of Regional Leaders Program. It's an outstanding program. Um, and this is just recognized statewide to really just really just training and producing great leaders um, in the state and in the region. And so that was really exciting to kind of see that and see a lot of the things that they accomplished as part of that training. Um, the other thing is, um, as you, I know you heard a lot about Innovate 680 today, 
Um, and I, you can see that kind of data diagram that, that we always show and, and it's very, very rich, very, very data rich program. The, the automated driving system grant, Innovate 680, the mobility as a service platform. And so we had the opportunity, we're trying to figure out data, we're trying to learn how to adopt data into CCTA as part of those projects. And we actually had the opportunity to tour a water cooled data center um, called Nautilus Data Technologies. And that was really, really interesting. They, they basically have a, a zero evaporation cooling system uh, for these, for these uh, servers as part of this data center. It's one of a kind. Um, it's, a, it's intended to be very sustainable and environmentally friendly. What I did learn is all of our cell phones um, actually use pretty much uh, like almost, I, I forgot the exact number, but it was, it was several gallons of water per day, just based on the data you use on your phone every day and where that data is stored and how it's cooled um, in these massive data centers. So that was an interesting kind of takeaway from uh, data and how we're approaching data. Um, as you heard, we had the tour today with the county administrator and um, Commissioner Glover. Uh, Chair Geringer, Vice Chair Kelly, as well as Commissioner White, um, and with Monica Nino, the new uh, County Administrator. We also had a fireside chat with her, and we've been spending some, some time with county and county staff, uh, really to understand how we can continue this partnership uh, around Gomentum Station. Uh, right now, the facilities at Gomentum Station provide about 50 to 70% of our partner needs for testing, and we're looking for opportunities to expand our facilities and really bring in the necessary investment uh, to really in, you know, increase the, the, the facilities to meet all of their needs. Um, and I said, and then one last thing is we, uh, speaking about transit, um, you know, we, we really can't forget about ferries. And so thank you to Commissioner Glover. Uh, we had a great conversation with WIDA about their strategic plan process and really positioning Contra Costa County to, um, to expand ferry service to Hercules, Martinez, Pittsburgh, and Antioch. And so ferry service is an important piece to the transit equation and we don't wanna forget about it. And we're making sure that we're, that we're gonna be able to expand that ferry service through the WIDA strategic plan as well. So, um, so it, it's been a really exciting month and um, happy to take any, any questions that you may have. Thank you, Tim. Any questions or comments from anyone? Seeing no hands, um, we will quickly touch on item 13. It's the calendars. And just a reminder, I'll say it again at the end of the meeting, but we don't have a meeting in August. That is our traditionally uh, dark time. So um, I know you all miss, miss, and that's we have a lot on this agenda, but you get next month off. Um, and now we'll move to agenda item number, uh, agenda item 14, which will be a closed session. We'll convene to provide a performance evaluation and conference with labor negotiators pursuant to government code 54957 for the authority's executive director. Following our closed session, we will reconvene in open session. Um, and we will now, and Terry Ann, I did not um, ahead of time, talk about the logistics of this. Um, so I went ahead and set up a breakout room. So I have everyone pre-assigned. I'm gonna go ahead and open all those rooms. So you should get a notification to enter the breakout room. And then when you're done, come back into the main session and we will report on any, if there's any reportable action will be done at that time. Great. Any, are there any questions before I open up the rooms? Okay. okay. Go ahead and open that now. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And um, we will now reconvene in open session and I will report that we took no reportable action from closed session and we'll move on to adjournment of the meeting and remind everyone that we will be back again in se on September 15th. 2021 and uh, looking forward to hearing how you spent your August time frame. So thank you all very much. And good evening. Back again on September 15th.